Hello, Super Nerdy members. We're so glad to be with you on a Monday night. Uh, my name is Liz Erickson, and my pronouns are she, her, and I am calling in from Oakland, California. Um, and a little fun fact about me is that I love to throw ice cream taste testing parties <laughs> as a little bit of joy and um, make my friends rate my ice cream that I make on a rubric. <laughs> Cause I love feedback and I love learning and growing, which makes sense because I lead learning and development at super majority. Um, and so I see a lot of folks doing this already, but at the beginning of calls, we love to see Karen. I wish you were closer here. You would also, you'd be invited to these ice cream parties. Um, so as you join, we'd love to see um, your name, your pronouns, where you're calling in from. Um, part of our power is being a super majority of voters all across this great big country. So we'd love to see where you're calling in from. Um, and at Supermajority, we deeply believe in the power of storytelling and women in their lives sharing their stories is crucial to creating the connections and empathy and ultimate change that we're driving for as a community. Um, it's also how we build political power and equip women to lead in our communities so we can make the majority rules real for all of us. So on this call, we have a few goals. First, um, you might feel that it's a time of desperation for women and we do too. Um, so in moments of desperation, especially with what has happened um, with Roe v. Wade, um, we need to glean wisdom from what um, has come before us and how women thought about gaining that power. Um, so we have Heather Booth in conversation with us tonight to learn from that wisdom. And we wanna figure out what to do to support women now and in the future. So that's a big goal of what we're up to tonight. Um, and we are committed to giving you opportunities to take action then with how to fight for women now and in the future. So a few norms as we kick off this call. Um, one, please be on camera if possible. We're figuring out how to make sure that we gave you the permission to be on camera because we wanna make sure it's extra secure. So we're gonna make sure we get that for you. Um, the second is to stay on mute unless prompted to do otherwise. Um, the third is to keep all chat in the chat box relevant to the discussion. And the fourth is to encourage and uplift each other. And so if you agree with these norms, we'd love for you to put a plus in the chat. I'm gonna show you what that looks like, um, just to make sure that we're timely and good with this discussion. Great, love seeing this. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, we have an agenda for the call tonight. First, um, we are going to be in discussion with Heather Booth and our um, Chief Impact Officer at Supermajority, Jara Butler, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Um, they're then going to take some questions from us. So if you have questions in your mind, um, please be like thinking of them and be putting them in the chat because I'll be then feeding them up to make sure that those get answered. Um, third, we're then going to go into breakout rooms and make sure you have a chance to talk with each other, connect with each other, build those connections across the country, hopefully get some hope with one another as you um, create those relationships. And then we'll close out with ways that you can get connected and take action. So any questions, would love to see that in the chat. Anything that's unclear? Okay, not seeing any. So with that, I really just wanna get in conversation with Heather and Jara um, without further ado. So two quick introductions. Um, Jara is the chief impact officer at Supermajority. She's a seasoned political strategist. She's a proud graduate of the University of Georgia Public School, um, School of Public and International Affairs. She's an accomplished Democrat activist with over 22 years of experience in political campaign management and special interest advocacy. My personal favorite thing about Jara too, is she gives a lot of like Texan sayings that I like write down and love and like laugh about. And so hopefully a few of those come out tonight. Um, we also have Heather Booth, um, which we are so lucky to have with us tonight at Supermajority. Heather is also one of the country's leading strategists about progressive issue campaigns and driving issues in elections. She started organizing during the civil rights, anti-Vietnam war and women's movements in the 1960s. She started Jane, an underground abortion service in 1965, which will be the center of our conversation tonight. And all of that was before Roe. 
my personal favorite introduction of her is from Senator Elizabeth Warren, who said, when I was introduced to organizing, I was told two words, Heather Booth. So we are lucky to have both of them tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to spotlight both of them and make sure that they're good to go for conversation. All right. Whenever you're ready, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. Um, Heather, thank you for joining us. Um, again, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Jara Butler. I'm the Chief Impact Officer. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm so excited to be joined here tonight with Heather. Um, a little bit of my Texan is probably going to come out. My accent is really strong because I am super, super nervous um, <laughs> um, to just be in the presence of someone who has just done so much for the movement, um, so much um, for women, but also has um, talked the talk and walked the walk. Um, and I'm just so grateful that she's able to join us tonight. Um, so to begin, Heather, would you, I just want to start um, by asking you to share with us your personal story. And how did you get involved and what led you to uh, the creation of the Janes? Before I do that, I want to say that I was somewhat nervous coming on this program because for over half a million strong with the incredible reputation that supermajority has and because I particularly love supermajority because you are, you combine the personal and the political. And you know, when the women's movement started it was a phrase, the personal is political. Those of my generation, we lived it. But what it meant was, before there was a women's movement, we believed that you, you, you suffered things in silence. We just thought, I can't get ahead in my job, it's just my fault. I can't get along with my partner. I'm trying everything, I'm doing everything that my partner wants, and it's not working. It's my fault. And then you realized others had the same problem. And if others have the same problem, it's a social problem. And if it's a social problem, it needs a social solution. And that leads to organizing. And supermajority combines them both, the personal support and the organizing for change. So Jara, your strategic sense, um, I appreciate your uh, managing this session, <laughs> managing me if you can. Um, and also to, to Liz and Taylor, and also to all of those of you looking in, listening in, and will be part of the conversation as we move on. Uh, truly, it is my joy to be here with you, even if it's a little nervous making, because I'm with a group and people who I know are my sisters, and I feel um, I want to do right together as we organized to change the world. And that's really to, to go back to Jara's first question of my own background. The key lesson that I've learned out of this life in the movement is that if we organize, we can change this world, but only if we organize, will we change this world? And I first really learned it when I was in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. In 1964, I went to Mississippi in a project that many of you heard about, the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. And that was uh, Northern students, I was in Chicago at the time, were recruited to go South to support incredibly courageous people in Mississippi, African-Americans who were willing to sometimes risk their lives in order to have the freedom to vote. And the summer gained notoriety because three of the young volunteers Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner were killed at the hands of the Klan. And most of you probably know that story. There are many other stories for the Summer Project. But within a year, we had a Voting Rights Act. And that's because people organized. I underscore it. Because now we are also in a challenging time. We're on a knife's edge between a criminal conspiracy to attack this country, to attack voting rights, to attack reproductive freedom, to attack the progress we've made over the last 50 years. But there's also a revival of a sense of democracy and justice 
and support for reproductive freedom, support for sensible gun laws, support for us having a voice in this country that is actually greater than it's ever been in my lifetime. And so we have a choice going forward. And what makes a difference is whether or not we organize for which way we, we, we move on that knife's edge. So I came from the civil rights movement and I went back to Chicago where I was in school and had learned this lesson from the civil rights movement that if we organize, we can change the world, but we need to organize. And a friend told me that his sister was pregnant and nearly suicidal and not ready to have a child. It was a more innocent time. And mostly we didn't even talk about sex with people we didn't know very intimately. And I don't recall ever talking about abortion at the time. Again, that's something that's been transformed in this period of time. And I didn't really know what to do about it, but I thought I'll try and help as a good deed, which is another lesson. All of our actions should flow from what we think is morally right. When confused, and I'm also often confused about what I should do, but I think about, well, what's the, what's the morally right thing to do? And is there a way I can do that? So I found a physician through the medical arm of the civil rights movement, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, a remarkable physician, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, who I didn't know at the time, but was a, had been a civil rights champion in Mississippi who came to Chicago when his name was on a Klan death list. He provided the procedure. I actually thought that would be it. It would be done. But word spread and someone else called. I made that arrangement and then word spread, someone else called and I realized I needed to set up a system. And I learned about what was involved. What do you do before? What do you do after? Um, what's the price? Could we negotiate on it? How do you, are there ways to treat the women with uh, as great respect as they, uh, they need and deserve? And we worked that out with Dr. Howard. And after a while, more and more people were coming through. Dr. Howard was no longer involved. I found out later he had been arrested for providing abortions in a clinic that he had in Chicago. And I found someone else named Mike. And we had the same arrangement that I had made with Dr. Howard and more and more people came through. So many that by, this started in 1965, by 1968, 69, so many were coming through, I couldn't manage it myself. So at each meeting that I'd go to anyway, a women's meeting or a community gathering, I'd say at the end of the meeting, if you want to work on abortion, come see me. And when about 12 women had said that they were interested, I gathered them together and I shared with them all the information I had about uh, what I had worked out with Dr. Howard and then, then with Mike. And more and more people started to come through. Now, Three people talking about an abortion in Chicago in 1965 or six, uh, really till 73 was a conspiracy to commit a felony. So rather than giving out our number and saying our own name, which I had done initially, so we gave out our number and said, call Jane. Pregnant and don't want to be? Ask for Jane. More and more people came through, so many so that Mike asked the women to help out and they were assisting. And then Mike decided he was gonna move on and it turned out Mike wasn't a doctor. At that point, the women said, if he can do it, they can do it. And the women of Jane performed 11,000 abortions between 1965 and 1973 when Roe became the law of the land. And because we took action, because we organized, not only did we save women's lives, all the women that I saw from Jane were so grateful for what happened, but we also helped build the momentum that because people organized led to Roe. We built an organization, it converted to political power, and it changed who were the justices who actually knew what justice was. From there, in just a sentence or two, I kept on in this movement work um, and have led many different organizations. In fact, 
this quilt behind me was given to me by a group called Wrapped in Love for Justice. And each square is a square about an organization I've been in or a movement that I've cared about uh, in my life. Financial reform, voter registration, a number of political campaigns, uh, marriage equality, I led that campaign. I was strategic advisor for immigration reform. And the overall message is all of these are connected. All our lives are connected. And the struggle for freedom and justice will go on when we combine the personal and the political. And when we organize, we have changed this world. And even now, at such a difficult moment, we will change this world. I don't even feel the need to ask the second question because as you were talking, I just, there were so many things that were going through, through my mind, especially about, you know, sometimes we have to do what's morally right, which is often sometimes the most terrifying things to do because one of the hardest things to do is stand sometimes when you feel like you're alone. Um, but talking about liberation, um, one of the, the people that I've looked to um, in my organizing is Fannie Lou Hamer. I drive everyone crazy, a super majority talking about this, but I bring up Fannie only because. Keep, oh my keep, God. keep talking, but I'm going to bring up a picture. Keep talking. I, I bring her up because she said when I, you know, um, this idea of liberation, when I liberate myself, I, I liberate you too. And that we are all connected in this and we are not in this alone. Um, and it's important that we see that all of these movements are connected because when they come after one, they're going to come after all. And I'm probably going to end up crying. But this is also the Texans about to come out in me too. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So this is this is me. I'm 18 years old in Mississippi, in Ruleville, Mississippi. This is Fannie Lou Hamer, the great heroine of the civil rights movement who who lived a life of moral dignity. And these are two of her friends at her home. I see it, there's a glare, so you can't quite see the picture. But yes, I, I'm sorry, Jared, go on. But she, she also is <laughs> no. very meaningful to me, but I wasn't just mouthing the words. I really mean it. She is, I, I, I just, I, I feel like, um, I feel like she raised a generation of Black women um, and she taught us how to organize, but she also taught us never to forget where you came from and always stand on, stand on it and always remember that you're bringing others with you and that it's okay to speak truth to power and that, that even if you have to challenge Dr. Martin Luther King, LBJ or whoever. So um, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about um, so many words that she had said. Um, and we've talked about your connection to the civil rights movement um, and how that work kind of led you into the Jane. But I'm curious, how did you decide to take on abortion access? Um, and how do we learn from that and focus now on with everything going on around us? Um, at the time, you had the Vietnam War, you had the civil rights movement, um, you had so many different movements happening. And how did this become part of your life work? And then how do we, as a community, um, come together and, and in the midst of everything going on around us? Well, there's so many things you've touched on. Um... For working on reproductive freedom, I explained how I first got involved. I wasn't choosing it as an issue and maybe it chose me. I've never actually had an abortion myself. I've never faced the question, but I wanted to treat a friend with dignity and respect and caring. I do believe the start of what we do that is most meaningful comes out of a moral commitment. In the civil rights movement, we called it building a beloved community. And now I often talk about it as having love at the center. 
In fact, just to show you how seriously I take it, I was the director of uh, progressive and seniors outreach for the Biden campaign. And I had about 250 volunteers who were full-time, about 8,000 who were volunteers part-time. And for the core of 250, I made two buttons for them. One button says, love at the center. And the other says, organize. And those are the two great messages that I feel we need to convey. And that means love for ourselves as well as love for others. Because actually, you know, going back even to Jerry, you're saying at the start that you were nervous. Everything in the society tells us that we're not good enough, that we don't know enough, that we're not smart enough. You're not tall enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not thin enough. You're not, you're not enough. And in fact, what supermajority does what organizing and building a movement with love at the center does is say not only are we enough but together we are a super majority together we can change this world but we have to support each other all of us often feel insecure lack of confidence i do almost all the time when i start something new and yet together, even in times of great terror, like in Mississippi, or like now, if we organize, we have changed the world and we will now. With something else you said though about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ms. Hamer, and facing uh, the threats on her life. She was made lame by the way, when she was beaten by a sheriff, in part because she was doing voter registration. She had decided herself to register to vote. It made me think that of something in the civil rights movement, people sometimes would say to each other, are you willing to die for freedom? Now, I very much wanted to live, but I was willing to take that risk. But I think now there is a somewhat different question, at least at this point, it's, it's will you live for freedom? Will you do the work every day when it's too boring, when it's too hot, like this now, when it's too cold, when I'm not, I'm tired, I was up late last night, I have too much to do. Will you do the work every day and live for freedom. And that really is what supermajority does. And you take the fight to the areas where it's most important, telling your story, then recruiting others to tell their story, and then getting involved and driving the organization into the elections and starting that cycle all over again. Again, I'm almost like I could literally listen to you um, and just not say anything because so much of what you're saying is the is wisdom, but it's also as organizers, it gets exhausting. Um, we have heard so many people say that they are just, they're tired. Um, and I remember talking to my mother. My mother was um, a black liberation activist. She was involved in the women's movement. Um, as a Texan, again, row. And she said, if you think you're tired, how do you think I feel? I've been doing this my entire life. Um, as we are entering into this new era, um, what lessons from your, what lessons do you have um, that you feel are important for us, especially those of us who are new to activism? And we are scared sometimes. The unknown is out there. Um, for some of us, we've had to let go of friends, family, um, but we're motivated and we're here. So it's like that first step. But what lessons from, from, from your amazing career and your amazing life do you have for us? And especially for those who are new to this. First of all, I think that you also have lessons 
that you know. And Jara, I want to ask you, what are the you think are the most important lessons that you want to pass on? Because honestly, it is now up to your generation for the leadership. I want to be your partner if it's helpful, but it's your generation that will make the change. And so you have lessons for us, all of you in supermajority. The main lessons I've learned, in part I've shared some of them, it's that you follow, I believe, because things often are so confusing, at least to ask yourself, well, what's the right thing to do? Usually you kind of know. Sometimes there are two things that seem to be the right thing to do and it's a little hard to figure out. And so you can talk with others, your sisters and brothers and, and others uh, about what we need to do. But to start with what you think is morally right, what's the decent caring thing to do? The second is we need to organize. We need to have a deeper relationship with others and really connect. Now, social media connects some, but in fact, the human relationship, finding out other people's stories, relating to them on that, and then finding a shared interest and on the shared interest moving together. And then having a strategic plan I actually think one of the main reasons that people drop out of this work is that they go from one action to another and it's protest, protest, action, action, but it doesn't seem to make sense, especially when times are hard. What's the theory of change you've got for how we will change this world? Right now, there's a good theory of change. Two more votes in the Senate, two more votes, and we have a democratic house, and we will open the filibuster and, and codify Roe. That is a clear plan and we can do it. And the states and the uh, states that you're working on and the Senate races and the House races, those are places that we can do this if we organize. There's a theory of what we're doing. It's not just random action. And so we have to turn our protest into power, our anger into action. And so some of those, those are some of the key lessons that I feel I've learned. But I'm interested, Jara, are there other lessons that you want to share? I know you said you were nervous. Now I'm probably making you more nervous. But the truth is, whatever it is you think, something, even if it's a repetition, what are the things that you think are important lessons for us and supermajority to know now? I think I keep going back to this idea of hope um, because I've shared this before, but my, I am the third generation of my family born out of slavery, third. Um, and my grandmother used to tell me sometimes all you have is hope. Um, and so I think that when it gets when we are in these dark moments where you just kind of can't, you, you just, you really don't know what to do. You don't know where, where to turn because there's so much. And I think I related to this so much in the documentary because there were so many women and it was so overwhelming. And you're looking at all of this happening and it's like, it's just me. But hope is that thing is if I just keep going, if I could help this one person, if I can help just two people, if I can do just a little bit more, if I can go just a little bit higher, if I can dig just a little bit deeper, because they can take a lot from me. They can take away my freedom. They can even try to take away my voice. But the thing that nobody can take from me is my hope because they didn't give it to me. It is mine um, to cherish and to hold. So as long as I've got it, I feel like, you know, we can keep going. Democracy is not a spectator sport. We are all a part of it. Our rights are not just freely given to us. We have to take them. And sometimes that means we have to do hard work. 
And it means going out and knocking doors in the hot sun. It means talking to people that don't want to talk to you. It means having the most awkward conversation in a Wendy's in South Carolina in 2008. Um, it means having to dig deeper. But for me, I'm competitive and ambitious. So it's like, I don't want just two seats, but I'll settle for two. I'll take, I'll take the two, but I want more. Um, when they asked Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when is there enough women on the court? I am, I love the fact that we have KBJ, but I want nine. You say that we, we don't have a black woman in the Senate. Okay, give me five and then give me 10. I want more, I want more and I want more. And I think what I have learned is it's okay for me to say I want more. So I think that that's where, that's where I am right now. Now, if you ask me two weeks from now, I may be at a different place, but I've just been digging into my hope reserve. Um, yeah, you know. I, I love what you said. And I believe we all need to become agents of hope. And in the chat, though I wasn't following all of it, um, someone said that uh, hope doesn't lead to action, action leads to hope. That when you feel despair, take action and it is a way to say, okay, I'm doing something when there is a strategic sense of how it will build. And even on the question of black women in the Senate, not only do we have wonderful candidates, Sherry Beasley and Val Demings, and I, and I, I ran the field operation for Carol Mosley Braun when she was the first black woman in the Senate. Um, in fact, one of the squares here is from the Cal Mosley Braun campaign. It says, you've never seen a senator look like me before, have you? Um, and we can do what otherwise seems impossible when we have hope in the unseen and take action to make it real. So Jara, I don't know if you, I'm glad to do more questions. I also didn't know if you want to get questions from the group uh, or any in the chat. And then. Um... Absolutely, let's, um, let's open the chat for questions. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. Uh, I will try to get them as quickly as I can. Um, but thank you so much, Heather, for, for sharing, for the work that you've done and also for just firing us up. Um, but I do have one question. What is the difference um, in the similarities between pre-row and post Dobbs? Well, for things that are different, first of all, the nature of the opposition is different. In 1965, this was not a partisan political issue. It hadn't been politicized. It hadn't put politicians in between us and the decisions of our lives with money behind it for political gain. In fact, I heard recently that one of the largest funders of the anti-reproductive freedom movement are the Koch brothers. Why would the Koch brothers who mainly produce uh, dirty energy and want no regulation and don't wanna pay taxes, why would they be funding anti-reproductive choice groups, uh, reproductive freedom groups. And the reason is because they've made common purpose and have decided that the, uh, the, the extremist right wing, uh, the MAGA Republicans have made a deal with many of the white evangelical churches and are funding them for shared political direction. And this wasn't true before. So the money in it, the politics in it, the partisanship and the ugliness of this fight. On the positive side, and there are many positives, the many things that people know, there, there's medic, medical abortion now available. It's the main uh, preferred form for most people. Um, the internet makes con communications faster and broader. Uh, you can, we can have Zoom. We can, I mean, in those days, we didn't, initially, we didn't even have an answering machine. We had to, and you had to write letters to people. We didn't have uh, <laughs> ways to, ways to communicate uh, like we do now. Um, 
There are more women gynecologists. There weren't even that before. There was a joke about, you know, the, um, there's a riddle that I often told about where the reason people never got the answer to the riddle is the answer was that the doctor was actually a woman and people couldn't imagine that even at that point. But the biggest change, the biggest change now is that we have changed as a people. Not only is the broad majority of this country believing that Roe should not have been overturned, not only does over 70% of the country believe that a politician should not come in between a woman and her physician, not only do people support us, so this is the popular issue, but that we have gained a new kind of confidence together and that there is a supermajority. Jara, there is you there in the leadership and you are providing strategic direction with your other sisters and, and brothers of goodwill. And because we have changed, I believe we also will change the world when we organize. And I see a number of hands are up. Um, so um, we do have a question in the chat. And then um, if you have your hand raised, do you mind uh, also putting your question in the chat if you don't mind? Thank you. Um, one question is, what examples of useful actions have you per perform seen performed by Americans who are living abroad? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, the person who asked it, I wondered if you've got anything that you want to share about Americans living abroad, or about other people living abroad. Americans living abroad. Well, partly that's not my real experience. I, my experience is from within, within America, though I did international uh, pro-democracy work for three years. Um, well, one is if you're in another country, it's also the engagement with the struggles of those countries. There's certainly enough struggles to go on for democracy and justice and freedom. There also can be the, um, the gathering of Democrats abroad for the votes here. That matters because every vote will matter. Um, and there's also the learning from other cultures. Uh, when I was in the early movements of the 60s, Paolo Freire was a uh, teacher first in Latin America and then in other places, who was learning, uh, he called it a pedagogy of the oppressed and learned ways to talk with people in their own language, to express themselves. And those lessons were then brought into the United States so that we could have um, in part consciousness raising and part uh, shared discussion so we could learn, so we could learn together. So I'd say it's both being in the culture that you're in learning those lessons, sharing them, and then even from abroad, doing the work that we need to do here. I, I would say one other thing, just on what we need to do in general, I often talk about four Ms, four Ms. Of the things that we need to do, one way to think about it is we need members. We need to recruit people. We need to um, engage people. How many people will you recruit? Will you recruit five more to take phone shifts? Will you recruit five more to do door knocking, to uh, do texting members? Secondly, we need message. Now, that's part of what you're doing. You're telling your stories, but also will you do the social media? Will you write op-eds? Will you have Zoom programs yourself with your own friends and other groups, just like we're having tonight? So members, message, money, we need money, money to support the centers, money, money and the services. You know, a center that was providing 500 abortions could be providing 1,500 abortions now. We need to support them. We need to support the organization. We need to support the staffing. We need to support uh, reinforcement so that we can build the powerful operations against that Koch brother and other money. And then we need movement. We need to show up. We need to be there when the call to action is there and then move into action and organization, into elections and back to action in a virtuous circle. We, I love the four M's. Thank you. And, and we absolutely do. Um, 
Another question that comes from the chat is what aspects or specific lessons you that you learned from the Janes made the greatest impact on the rest of your work? What actions from Jane? Yes. Uh, what aspects or specific lessons oh, you from learned Jane. from the Janes made the greatest impact on the rest of your work? Well, partly it was building a loving women's community um, that cared cared about each other, cared about the women who were coming through. Um, and actually being of use, doing something concrete and then learning together. No one knew how to do this beforehand, but we made the road while walking, as some say. And so I think that aspect and coming back even to Jarrah where you were starting, gaining the confidence that alone we may not know how to do this, but together we can change the world and help to. I believe we can. I believe we can. And I think, I hope everyone that's joining us tonight believes this too. I do want to ask this question um, because this is something that I think um, gets a lot of questions. Um, and because we are an organization that is about organizing um, women, it's interesting. Do you expect an upswell in the participation of women now that the Supreme Court has nullified Roe? Well, we've already seen that there's a change. Um, in fact, before the Roe decision was overturned, there was a lot of talk in the press about how the energy is all on the Republican side and MAGA is gaining and uh, the support for, uh, I mean, of the MAGA Republicans, none of that has dissipated because of January 6th of the MAGA Republicans. And that there was a diminished hope and belief that on the Democratic side, that we could make change. But after that decision, people were so furious and outraged and realized a new reality. There was a 78% of uh, Democrats believe that they were more energized to vote because of the Roe decision. And only 20% of Republicans were more energized to vote because of the decision. So the tide is shifting. We have heavy headwinds against us. We know that. Midterm elections often turn against the party in power. There is inflation, there is COVID. I've got my masks with me all the time. <laughs> uh, bands off our bodies is the, my favorite mask, but um, there's so many things that are exhausting us. It's, and it's, it's exhausting just to be in one battle after another. But in fact, we can, we need to leave this call and leave with the confidence, two more votes in the Senate, hold the House, and we need down the ticket. So we need attorneys general, we need secretaries of state, we need governors. And when you look at the reality, if the election is seen vaguely, like, oh, there's an election, are you happy with where things are? The answer is no, I'm not happy with where things are. But if you look at the real candidates, do we want Fetterman in Pennsylvania? This is a Democrat who has on his arm the dates when he was mayor, the dates that people were killed by gun violence in his, when he was mayor, because that's how much he wants to remember it. Against this phony Dr. Oz who lives in New Jersey. Or we have Warnock in, in Georgia with Stacey Abrams. I mean, you almost don't even need to say an alternative. What a great, courageous leader, even against all the voter suppression that's going on. And as you go one state after another, the real choice between the real Democrat and the real Republican is just an extraordinary uh, choice for, for democracy and the moral high ground versus tyranny and the other side of that knife's edge. But it all depends on, do we get out the message? Do we recruit the members? Do we raise the money? And do we show up in the movement? We can do this if we organize. 
Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and you're absolutely right. Um, and just one more shout out to Georgia, my adopted home state, my adopted college state, and Reverend Warnock. As a former member of Ebenezer, he's the real deal. And as a UGA graduate, we don't know that other guy. Anyway, <laughs> next question. Uh, what is the best way to get the ERA ratified? And then we have a couple of more questions before we're going to wrap for this evening. Thank you all. I'm trying, we're, and we are going to try to get it to as many questions as we possibly can. So thank you all for being so patient. And Heather, thank you so much for taking um, and answering all of these questions so thoughtfully. Well, it's the same answer, actually, as it is to the other issues. We need to recruit people. We need to share the message. We need to raise the funds and we need to build the movement. And all the issues are related. We will need a Democratic pro-ERA majority in the Senate. We'll need a Democratic pro-ERA majority in the House. We also will need those majorities in the states. And we are coming close. We just need to push it over. And we can push it over on the issues of most immediate concern to people. So right now, just as one example, there is a chance that we will win a negotiation on prescription drug prices that will also do something to lower the cost of inflation. This is something I fought for for 40 years. The pharmaceutical companies are amongst the most powerful in the entire country. And there is a chance that we will get this reconciliation bill up in the next couple of weeks. It won't be everything we want. We wanted much more. I've actually been working on this since the election. But if we get prescription drug coverage, if we expand the Affordable Care Act, those are the two issues most likely to be in the reconciliation package now as it's being discussed. This is not only a 40 year struggle, but it means that we will prove we can do something together, we can achieve something. So when that comes through, it's important for supermajority to also claim that victory. And as we claim that victory, we will have built the political power that then makes the next victory, whether it's the ERA or voting rights or codification of Roe, it makes it all the more possible. Absolutely. Um, another question we have is about messaging. Um, we, um, the, question, the, the question actually is, um, as a vice chair of a town democratic committee, um, we are struggling to figure out our best messaging that will touch our constituents. Um, how do we get unified messaging? Do you have any thoughts? First of all, there's a lot that's going around that is pretty unified. Not everyone, we're a democratic party, but also things will become clearer as we get even closer to the election. So it also depends on what you do. We can be unified. On reproductive freedom, first of all, we now know that freedom is how we speak about this because that's the, if this is if you wanna persuade people and energize people. We want, we want freedom. It's not a superficial consumer choice. It's about freedom. And this is the most, here's one way to talk about it that has been tested. It's the most intimate decision in a person's life about when or whether or with whom we have a child. And so there's a pretty strong unanimity that that's a way to talk about it. Or we talk about January 6th, which is another thing that's uh, engaging us. This is a criminal conspiracy by an extremist MAGA faction of the Republican party to undermine our lives, undermine the country, and undermine democracy. All parts of that have been tested. And supermajority, part of what's wonderful is it goes not just what a vague idea is, but actually what's been tested. And so we can have a unified message. It's true we're not all together, but supermajority can help set the pace. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Heather. I just want to. Um... As we begin to wrap, um, I just wanna say thank you so much again for joining us. Um, and thank you so much for uplifting the work of supermajority um, and the work that we are doing every day. And I, and I speak on behalf of my colleagues that we are so grateful to you 
Um, I always say to those who came before us, we need to honor you and give you your flowers while you're here. Um, so this is a moment that I wanted everyone to just honor you and thank you for the work that you have done, how you have shown us leadership, um, how you have inspired an entire generation of people, including myself. Um, and I just want you to know that we appreciate you. We value you. Um, and we thank you for entrusting us with this next journey because we are going to take on that mantle. Even though it's scary sometimes, it's exhausting, but we can do this. And I truly, truly believe it. So thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you who had questions that I wasn't able to get to you, I apologize sincerely. Um, we could have talked to Heather for um, hours. Um, and I hope that we can bring you back again. Um, but I do want to turn it over to Liz, who has an exciting call to action, because we are not going to close this down. We have a purpose for being here, um, and it is not just for us to engage and be in community, but we um, want you to act. So thank you all. Yes. Thank you, Heather. Incomparable. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, Jara, for the synthesis and the questions and your own story and your experience too. Uh, appreciate your wisdom as well. Um, okay, a few closing things for us as we end the night. Um, you heard from Heather and we deeply believe that organizing changes the world. Um, the big takeaway for tonight. So we have three things that you can do right now to organize with us. Um, the first, there are three key primary elections next week, August 2nd, that will impact women's ability to access abortion. And we need your help turning women out. So the first is an election in Kansas. You may be thinking, Kansas is not supermajority's primary states. What's going on in Kansas? So Kansas, while it's not our priority state, they are the first state that will be able to literally vote on a state constitutional protection for abortion in a post Dobbs world. We are asking women to vote no on a ballot initiative, which will protect abortion access in the state. So first, go on Facebook and search for folks you know who live in Kansas and make sure they vote. You may be like, Liz, I don't own in Kansas. Search your book, like search all your contacts and see. Um, and to lift this up, I want to invite Lori, who organizes a whole bunch in Canvas, to go off mute and share anything that we need to know related to Kansas with this vote. Lori, are you with us? I'm here. Awesome. Anything I'm missing, Lori? You nailed it. I actually just got a text here that makes me very happy. There is a postcard group out of uh, Georgia, believe it or not that mailed out, we just got it confirmed today, 324,000 handwritten postcards to Kansans in Western Kansas that otherwise wouldn't get touched by media from the Kansas. They always get everything from Denver. So we're completely on cloud nine about that. Um, there's been some discussion on the polls and the poll, if you actually look at the, the data, it's, it's looking good. This thing might get beat. Mm. So if you know anybody in Kansas, call them up and make sure they vote next Tuesday. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lori. Appreciate your work. Um, thank you for your activism and being with us. Um, if you guys, if guys, if anyone on this call needs those get out the vote conversations in that language, email me, Liz at supermajor.com. I can help you with some of that language if you're nervous to make those calls. So we're with you, Lori, and um, thank you for your work in Kansas. Okay, so that's number one. Number two um, that we're thinking about is Arizona. Arizona also has a primary on August 2nd. On Wednesday, which is two days from now, we are going to be texting young women voters, both white women and women of color, to remind them to vote. We care a lot about Arizona because we need to hold Mark Kelly's Senate seat if we have any hope of extending our thin majority and passing a federal protection for abortion access through the Women's Health Protection Act. So sign up and support there. Um, we'll drop a link. Um, it's actually just in the chat that you saw that from Taylor. That's our Arizona texting and that's happening this Wednesday. And then finally, Michigan also has a primary next week which is August 2nd. 
Michigan, as you probably know, we had a member call maybe like two and a half weeks, three weeks ago. Michigan currently has a trifecta of women in office that women voted to be there that are holding the line for abortion, the AG, our house seat and the governor. And these three women were elected by women and single-handedly protect the right to access abortion in the state. So we must protect these women. We have a lot of organizing work happening in Michigan that you can get involved in and we'll make sure that you have that action as well. So that mobilized link is in the chat as well. I hope you're leaving tonight feeling that you are the organizers we need to make this difference. You are the supermajority that we're organizing and hoping for to make sure that our issues are not like a side women's thing, but they that are we're a feared and revered voting block of people. So thank you for being with us tonight. We appreciate you. We'll make sure that there is a recap email out and that this is on the site for you to go back and reference. Um, thank you again, Heather. Thank you, Jara. Thank you, Taylor, and all the folks at Supermajority that made this call happen. Um, without further ado, we're going to close out.